Our speaker is going to uh, speak for about 50 minutes or so, and there will be plenty of time for questions and answers afterwards. So as he speaks, and maybe things occur to you, please do be thinking of questions you might like to ask uh, towards the end. Now, when I was speaking uh, with our speaker uh, earlier in the week, he asked me not to give him too much of an introduction, because I'm sure uh, many of you have heard a lot of things about him. You may have read something about him, and I'm sure he will be saying a bit about his story in his talk. Uh, he simply asked me to say, uh, ex-politician, ex-prisoner, but now not doing either of those things, <laughs> but something a bit different. So, John Blakin, uh, please welcome him. Good evening, everyone. Um, whenever I see a large audience like this, I <clears throat> somehow wonder to myself, why have they all come? <laughs> and my best guess at this is really because most people from childhood onwards enjoy stories. And so I will do that. I will tell you a story. <clears throat> I hesitate to call it my story. I'm really only the narrator of the story. The hero of the story is somebody quite different and emerges at a later stage of it. I'll begin this story at the most dramatic moment of it. Can you switch your microphone off? Oh, I'm so sorry, not doing very well. <laughs> Rather essential. <coughs> is that working? Oh. Okay. Technology was never my um, The only important thing I said is that I'm going to tell you a story. I am not the hero of the story. I'm just the narrator of it. I'll begin the story at the most dramatic moment of it, uh, because as an old storyteller, I know if I do that, I have my best chance of getting and holding your attention. And the most dramatic moment I can time and date with some precision, Tuesday the 8th of June, 4.25 p.m., and I was standing at a, in a distinctly uncomfortable place, the dock of the Old Bailey. I'd been ushered into that dock <coughs> just a few moments earlier by a court warder who was obviously a kindly soul. He must have been <coughs> racking his brains to think of something pleasant to say to me on what was a very unpleasant occasion. <coughs> and the, um, to do this, he transformed himself into a sort of touchy-feely tourist guy. And he said rather brightly, after a mistake in, do you realize you're in the most famous courtroom in the world, and now that's the famous dock in Britain, and all kinds of interesting people have been there before you, uh, Jack of Britha, Lord Baldwin, <laughs> Ray Bowers, and now you. I, I wasn't in that famous dock of court number one for very long, because I had already pleaded guilty to charges of perjury arising out of a foolish libel case I uh, fought a lot some time ago. And so all that had to happen was for the judge to sentence me. And he did so in the time-honored language the judges use on these occasions. He said, the sentence of the court will be, you will serve 18 months in prison. Take him down. And I just had the time to blow a kiss to my four teenage children and my 88-year-old mother who was sitting in the well of the court. And then I did head down, down, down some <coughs> stairs into the subterranean depths of the old baby. And there, I was very quickly put into handcuffs. And then, after a bit of form filling, quickly put into a sweat box, which is the name prisoners give to the, those big white vans you see sometimes driving around our cities with barred windows on them. And in my case, about 20 others, we were driven off to Her Majesty's Prison, Belmarsh, in South London. A Belmarsh, in the jargon of prisons, prisoners, is known as a tough nick. And it certainly felt like it that day as we rolled through these massive fortress like gates and doors and high coils of barbed wire. And when we got off the sweatbox, there were a whole lot of very stern looking prison officers with Alsatians on leashes barking at us. And we all went into a place called the Cage, which is the name given to the reception cell in big prisons. It's a sort of uh, iron barred enclosure, um, big ish but not very large. And 
Business was very brisk that afternoon in the cage because from all over London and South East England, as far away as even Hampshire, people were piling in from the courts after being sentenced. And with the habitual optimism of most criminals, uh, many of them had expected the jury would believe every word they said, or the judge would go in. But by the time you've arrived in the cage of Belmarsh, and you're doing a five or doing a seven, or whatever they call it, um, reality has dawned, and often in a very unhappy way. I would forget that scene in the cage as long as I lived. There was it's like a wild west. There were gangs fighting with each other. I remember one poor guy getting punched very hard at one shouting, you got the script wrong, you got the script wrong, that's why you're wearing all in here. I remember one young man who was sort of, uh, so wild that he was simply charging into the bars of the cage over and over again till his head stood open, blood poured over the face. Um, uh, uh, medical aid had to be sent for. And in the middle of all this noisy semi-mayhem going along with fighting and yelling and sobbing. Um, suddenly an officer came up to me and said, Aitken, your turn to see the prison psychiatrist. <laughs> now I knew I was having a down day, but I, I didn't think I needed the services of a psychiatrist. Uh, but I did not then know, what I now know is that every single incoming prisoner is actually seen by a psychiatrist or a medical qualified person to check out whether or not there was a suicide risk. So it was not the reason why if I headed to the psychiatrist's office. To get the humour of uh, what happened next, I need to remind some of you that my sentencing had not gone unnoticed by the great British public and the great British <laughs> media. That <laughs> um, uh, I think I was the first cabinet minister to be sent to jail since Tudor times. So it was news. And indeed, I'd been on the front pages all the previous day, all that day, live on the six o'clock news and indeed outside Belmarsh prison by this time there were at least a hundred if not two hundred journalists with our satellite dishes all broadcasting live onto the whatever it was news. So there's a lot of excitement um, but not in the mind of the prison psychiatrist because he'd been having a busy day, he hadn't been tuned into the media so he had the faintest clue that I might be anybody who'd had any media attention and I was a completely anonymous prison to her, him. And so to check out my possible suicidal tendencies, he rattled off a box of standard list of questions in the form. Name, prison number, date of birth, next of kin. Does your next of kin know you're in prison? And the question after that was, does anyone other than your next of kin know you're in prison? <laughs> I gave the psychiatrist a wry smile and I said, as a matter of fact, I think perhaps by now, 15 or 20 million people might know. The <laughs> psychiatrist did not return my wry smile. Instead, he scribbled very busily on his pad and then said, in, turn, in terms of some asperity, do you mean to tell me you really think that 15 or 20 million people know you're in prison? Do you? <laughs> and I nodded. And then his tone became much kinder and indeed more, more clinical. <laughs> and he said to me in a soft voice, may I ask you, CB9298, have you anyone in your life ever suffered from delusions? <laughs> <laughs> well, my delusions were getting shed pretty fast that afternoon, and uh, the next thing that happened after endless prison rituals, strip searching, mug shotting, fingerprinting, form filling, etc., etc., Eventually, I was taken off to a cell, and I think as I went into that cell, the uh, officers were scolding me, must have said something like, you can go aching. Um, and when I got into the cell, I was very relieved to find that I got a cell to myself, which was slightly unusual, but not that unusual. And so I sat down on the edge of the bed and said, well, it's been a tough day, it's been a long day, maybe the worst day of my life, but you know, I'll now be able to get my head down and get a good night's sleep. No such luck, because the prisoners of Belmarsh, unlike the psychiatrists of Belmarsh, had all been tuned into the media, and they were very well uh, advertised about my arrival. And now my left and right cell neighbours, who'd heard the officers putting me in the cell, took it upon themselves to start a sort of Afro-Canadian chant. 
um, designed, I think, to tell everyone where I was. And just as the chant, I think I've got a spare of the fruity details the chant is wearing the church. <laughs> but the just as the chant was that expedient to leave the Vikings and I arrived in cell 3D1B and host block 3. Tomorrow morning, lads, let's show you. And then there were a whole lot of anatomical suggestions which suddenly joined in by people along the landing, other house blocks across the exile, and this chant. Uh, I realised it was all about me, and it was pretty unpleasant. I make light of it now, but it was actually pretty frightening. I hadn't sort of been prepared for this. And um, I was really quite scared. What on earth was going to be like prison rooms like this in the first hour or two? And I was so scared that I then remembered something, which was that when I'd been going to the El Bailey that morning, a man who uh, looked a bit strange had there's a place called the Defendant's Entrance. And he thrust into my hand a little booklet, which I had put into my pocket when I was in my up breast pocket of my prison uniform. And when I pulled it out and looked at it, it had the title, Pray in the Psalms. I'm not sure I really knew what that meant, but I had a look at it, and it was a, a sort of calendar-type booklet. And on this particular day, Tuesday the 8th of June, 1999, the uh, was a little psalm which was called Psalm 130. And I didn't know it at the time, but it's known to some people as the prison psalm. It's also known as the out of the depth psalm. It begins with the words out of the depths, and I cry to you, Lord, Lord, hear my voice. And the reason it's called the prison psalm is because when Oscar Wilde served his time in prison, he wrote a book afterwards with the title De Profundis, a sort of prison memoir, and that was based on the Latin title of the psalm, Out of the Depths. Anyway, I read the psalm, and it had a very good effect of sort of calming me down. It was all about, you know, I was in the depths, and he can't climb out of the depths, but he can climb out of it with God's help, and it ends up, and I will give you, I think, uh, a plenteous redemption and God's love. I thought I needed a bit of that. So I read it two or three times, and then it put me into a um, sort of relaxed mood somehow, so much so that I fell asleep in my first night in prison. I slept very well for the next seven or eight hours. I was woken up by a sound I got used to every day in my sentence, which is of officers coming along the prison wing, uh, throwing open the doors with a shout, unlock everybody out on the landing, and you have to come out as a roll call. And as I stood there the first morning in my first day in prison, I suddenly realised that my left and right next door neighbours had been the noisiest vocalists and the originators of the excluded deleted chant the night before, so I became even more nervous. Only to find that these guys who'd been so vociferous the night before were the following morning very friendly. <coughs> morning, they said, um, how are you? Hope you slept well. Sorry about last night, said one. Nothing personal, said the other. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we were just on the tackle, on the drugs. Um, you know, it was every night. Don't mind about you, one of us now. Come and have a rosy, come and have a cup of tea. And very gradually, I started to enter the community of my wing. I was pretty cautious at first. I'd been told that the wise thing to do, so I kept my head down. And sort of started to get accustomed to the landscape of prison. As I did this, my eyes saw one or two unexpected things. The first one was how young everybody was. The average age of a prisoner in our big London prisons is in the order of 25, 26, which means that there are lots of teenagers, 18, 19 year olds, floating around the system. I felt like a thousand at the age of 55 by comparison. So that was one surprise. Another surprise, was the extraordinary prevalence of drug use and abuse. My first weekend in Belmarsh, so many people were spinning around uncertainly, waving their arms, that um, I thought I was in some sort of Moroccan soup rather than English <laughs> girl. And that was another surprise. The third surprise, as I started to get to talk a bit with one or two of my fellow prisoners, was I realised that for all the bad things we'd all done, quite a lot of the people were themselves pretty vulnerable people. And I stumbled across this as a result of not an amusing incident. Um, 
And suddenly a young prisoner came up to me and said in a conspiratorial whisper, Hey, I've got a problem. Can you help me? My problem is I've had a letter from my brief and I can't read it. Could you read it? So I said, sure, and I read him this letter, which was from his sister saying that he and his young family were going to be evicted from their council flat in London for non-payment of rent. When I gave the guy this news, it, he went wild. He sort of started climbing up the wall, shouting and yelling and screaming. Um, the only coherent scream was, what shall I do? What shall I do? My kid's going to be on the street. What shall I do? Well, as it happens, considering we were in HMP Belmarsh, he could not have found a more expert source of advice. Because for the previous 24 years or so, in fact, HMP, I had been doing eviction cases. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew every wrinkle of the system. I knew exactly what notes to strike in the letter of appeal. Uh, one of them is I will get one of my relatives to pay off some of the rent arrears by installments and it buys you more time, etc. And he thought it was a brilliant idea, this suggestion, uh, which I told him would probably work. And then his face fell a bit and he said, Hey, I've got another problem. I don't do no reading nor no writing neither. Would you write it for me? So I said, sure. So I wrote him a letter of appeal, finding on just good grounds for an appeal and some anyway, saving some time. And when I finished it, it was kind enough to say it was a good letter. And then he said, he took it, he signed it, and then most unexpectedly, he instead of putting it in his pocket or instead of putting it in his um, the letter box, he did something unusual. He held the letter aloft as though it was an 18th century town crier. He went down the lock of the wing saying over and over again in a loud voice, hey guys, this MP geezer of ours, he's got fantastic joined up writing. <laughs> testimonial, my graphological skills, fell on the ears of a surprisingly receptive audience. Because, as I've already hinted, an amazing number of people can't read or write in prison. Um, we actually know from the statistics, because everyone has to do a literacy test, um, that approximately a third of all prisoners can't read or write. Um, I remember doing the test myself. The first question was, was hat sat on the M blank T, fill in the blank. And the questions got a little bit harder, but not much. Uh, anyway, I passed, but um, <laughs> <laughs> third, my third do not. I just stop for a moment to reflect. We heard a lot of talk about rehabilitation and reducing reoffending, as though these were easy to do. But um, if somebody is coming out of prison, cannot even read labels in a warehouse because they can't read or write. Their chances of getting a job, getting rid of it, are stunningly low, and that's one of the problems. Anyway, thanks to the advertising of the town crowd, from that evening onwards, I thought outside myself every night a queue of young men wanting letters read to them or written for them often on the most intimate subjects imaginable. And I actually very much enjoyed studying the kind of prison in my because I got to know my prisoners, fellow prisoners pretty well when you were hearing their life stories. And um, <coughs> life was very busy for me in this um, letter writing, letter reading room. It became the joke of a certain amount of good natured prison humour. I remember one old lad said to me one day, hey John, do you realise with all this letter writing business of yours, you is having a fantastic impact on the girls of Brixton. <laughs> <laughs> they can't believe the sudden improvement in their love letters they're getting to. <laughs> well, be that as may, I was certainly making a few friends. And one of the friends I made was a young, energetic, rather charming Irish burglar, unexpectedly, unsurprisingly called Paddy. And Paddy was a young man of uh, considerable charm, and he one evening, after I'd written several letters for him, he invited me into his cell for a cup of coffee. That's a considerable mark of trust from one prisoner to another. Anyway, I sat down and had the coffee with Paddy, and we had a long conversation, which roamed across the sort of topics prisoners usually about their families, their regrets, 
when they get out of here, what they're going to do, what they're hoping for, all these kind of things. And after about an hour or so of this rather warm, intimate kind of conversation, suddenly Paddy changed conversational gear. And being an old politician, I immediately recognized the gear he had changed into. I would call it the gear of a vote of thanks speech, because he cleared his throat and became very formal. He said, <coughs> John, on behalf of the lads, I've been tasked with saying thank you to you for all these letters that you've been writing for me and others. And to show you how much we appreciate it, I've also been tasked with making a gift to you. And the gift I'm going to give you <coughs> is that you can have anything you like to choose free of charge, absolutely free of charge, from me library. And then he dived on the left-hand side of his bed, rummaged around the tattoo old cardboard box. And then out emerged, he spread them out in front of the area expansively, an amazing selection of hard or poor After a fleeting moment of temptation, <laughs> I said, uh, thanks, but no thanks, Patrick. But there must have been something in the way I said it which was reverting to my old habit of being a pompous politician. <laughs> because Paddy went really angry, and he started shouting, oh, sneering at me, are you? judging me, are you? looking down on me. Are you? Then before I could try and stalk this sort of melting lava flow of anger in my direction, Paddy stopped himself with a most ingenious idea. That's <laughs> why I might have said anything. It's always, a, if it's boys you're after. <laughs> And I very reluctantly said, I'm really not to answer the question, but I did. I said, well, if you really want to know, Paddy, it's because I'm trying a different path in life. Oh, what kind of path would that be? <laughs> and more hesitatingly, I said, well, if you want to know, Paddy, I said rather shyly, it's the path of sort of searching for faith, looking, uh, sort of seeking for faith, and um, it's uh, helping me. It's, uh, that's the path my mom these days. There was some sort of pause, a lot of meaningful silence in that cell. And Paddy said, you know, I'd really like to try that path myself. How do I get onto that path? And, uh, and some sort of floodgates <coughs> broke open inside him. And he said, you know, Minan used to like all the kind of Jesus stuff. And she had something. And she had a meaning to her life. And you know, I don't think I've got any meaning by that. I mean, everything seems to go wrong for me. Even when I got money in my pocket, which is a rather new way of getting it, <coughs> even when I got money in my pocket, uh, nothing seems to make sense, my relationships still away. And so maybe that path does mean something that my name is on. I can see, watching you in this prison, maybe you've got something. So tell me about that path. How do I get on that path? I cannot tell you how much I did not want to engage in this dialogue. Um, I was no sort of preacher now. I was struggling in all kinds of ways. The idea that I wanted to start talking about faith and so on was just untrue. On the other hand, Paddy had a sort of compelling creed de coeur sort of manner, so I thought I'd better try and answer. So I said, well, I think the way we get on the path of Paddy is that you pray. How do we pray then? Well, I used to belong, if I belonged to anything in those days, to the Church of Protestant Wing of Anglicanism, which simply didn't do praying out loud. <coughs> so this was talking about the blind leading the blind, but anyway, Paddy and I did pray to you. First night, second night, third night, fourth night. And then Paddy said, Lord oh, Church, you know, this stuff's far too good just to keep to the two of us. <laughs> and I thought he meant he was quite likely to have to bring another Irish project to make out of the two simple threesome. <laughs> Not a bit. Paddy had bags of energy and drive, and he had in the qualities of a good recruiting sergeant. <laughs> so he shot up around the jail, recruiting. He said, um, anyone want to come and pray with me and Johnny tonight? <laughs> and then the whole about eight or nine people showed up. Um, I can remember their names quite well, which meant anything to you, but perhaps their occupations were interesting. There was a blagger, there was an armed robber, there was a the Big Dipper of Brixton, who was a ace pickpocket. There was um, a blow, a cracked safe for him. There, were, there was a kiter who didn't just pass a few dead checks. 
He passed spans so many of them, they flew around like kites. I was getting used to these sort of prison expressions. And then there were a couple more Irish burglars, I think, and a couple of lifers, and of course murderers. So we have uh, something unusual, a little tribe of gathered together. Uh, so unusual, they gave a completely new meaning to the Christian term, a soul group. <laughs> anyway, there we were. And everyone looked at me and said, how do we pray? Now, a few months earlier, I had done an Alpha course. And I'll just stop there and say something about that before I return to the narrative, because I know that you are doing an Alpha course on this step very soon. When someone suggested to me in my long running waiting to go to jail, um, you should do an Alpha course, I said, what's that? And they described it to me, and I was absolutely determined not to do it. I was the most reluctant Alpha girl ever. I said, Happy clappies, twanging electric guitars, people sitting around in groups confessing their sins to one another, cheesy Christians going over the top. I'm not going near it. I don't need to be introduced to Christianity in 12 sessions or it was. But my friends who'd come alongside me in a very kind way, and trying to sort of help me uh, in a spiritual sort of sense, were persistent. <coughs> and um, they said, you only have to come once. You know, um, you just don't like it, you can come again and just see it, what it's like. It's a sort of very good way of feeling your way into a faith. So I sort of said I would come, and on the first night I didn't go, but these eager believers uh, turned up at my door and said, We escort you there. So I, <laughs> so I went along. And my first night of listening to an album, of course, I was actually hugely relieved. It, they were happy to clap it at me, the talk was very good to the historical Jesus told me all kinds of things I never knew about historians and Josephus and others who um, had things in their books about uh, the early Christians and Jesus. And um, the group I was talking about talking afterwards was very congenial, intelligent, not a good discussion. But even so, even though it's all been quite good, I said to myself, not really me, this kind of stuff. <coughs> I don't think I'll um, uh, come back next to the top of the I don't think I'll come back next uh, Thursday if I've got a better invitation. The problem was, it was a time in my life I wasn't getting any invitations. And so I did turn up next Thursday and had rather a rather similar experience. I thought it was rather good in a condescending sort of way. Um, <clears throat> but I went to come back next Thursday, it's not me. No invitations next Thursday, so I went again. And the next talk was called, How Do We Pray? And I always remember it was given by an attractive young woman in a miniskirt rather than a figure. <laughs> and this young woman um, got my attention, not just because I'm a miniskirt, because she did give <laughs> an outstanding talk about how we listen to God, how we communicate to God. And she ended up in a rather sort of um, kind of girl guide leader sort of way or the boss who said, now then, if you want to restructure your prayer lives, I'll give you a good tip, here's a little mnemonic for you, act, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. If you try that, you'll soon find yourself restructuring your prayer life. I didn't have a prayer life to restructure, but when I actually got home that night, a rather lonely time in my life, my wife had left me and was saying for divorce, um, my um, children were scattered and there were schools around the place. So I was alone at home and I said, I said well, I have heard that standing talk about prayer. Maybe I should give it a try. Um, what was that thing she said? Adoration, confession. Anyway, I did give it a try. And it wasn't sort of a quick fix and just something like that. But quite gradually, when you get into the discipline of prayer, a bit of structure, I found that it was somehow getting hold of me. And I kept going, nothing happened that quickly. But gradually, um, I felt I was somehow moving on a journey. A journey perhaps rather like somebody who was crossing some remote part of the world and going across frontiers. And they don't actually quite know which frontiers they're crossing, but they do know when they have arrived in a country of a real and committed faith. 
And somehow or other, that has happened to me uh, before I went into prison. And I give Alpha a lot of credit for it, but also some wonderful fellow Christians who are seeing someone in trouble came alongside me. Anyway, so when these guys said, how do we pray in the, uh, <coughs> this um, unusual cell group, I started to say, well, I don't really know, but um, I went to this talk in an uh, attractive young woman in the miniskirt, I got their attention, and I said, <laughs> she said, um, you know, you should structure your prayer life by uh, mnemonic, they probably have another word, um, called acts, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. And long before I got towards the end of that, I realized I had completely lost the attention of my very hero audience. Not quite. There was an, uh, a Nigerian drug dealer, himself, who I think had done a little Christian living in his time, and in a voice rich with the warmth of Africa, he said, oh, I get it, I get it. He said, adoration, that means telling God you think he's wonderful before you ask him for favors. <laughs> <laughs> Rather a good definition of adoration. Anyway, somehow or other, this program got going. I'll never know, quite know why, but it did. And of course, in prison, you all have all this fantastic time, I mean, masses of space. So we kept on meeting, first night, second night, then gradually grew a bit. And um, I will try and tell you in a serious moment what I think happened in that program. Because the key things that happened, I remember them just because my little mnemonic is that the most important things all began with P, the word P. That's just my way of remembering it, but I'll quickly tell you which the key P words were. And I think they are relevant, uh, not just to prisoners in jail, prisoners of all other kinds, like sin or broken relationship or illness, whatever it may be, and indeed people who are just pretty agnostic or lukewarm or, or half Christians, so I used to be, a state I now know as well as valuable as being half pregnant at the time, I thought it was fine. So, uh, here are the things that I remember happening in the program. First word beginning with P was pain. Now, all of us have pain in our lives sooner or later. But what's rather odd about pain, uh, certainly when you're talking about um, relatively respectable middle class England, and particularly for men, but the way we deal with our pain is very odd indeed. The first sort of male reaction is tends to be, I just pretend it's not happening at all. You know, let's uh, brush it aside. Uh, let's ignore it. Let's um, uh, deny it. Um, or let's do some of the things our culture tells us to do, uh, to um, keep a stiff upper lip, to pack up our troubles in our own kit bag and smile, 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 carry on regardless. That is a very English reaction. And I used to have that kind of reaction whenever I had any kind of trouble or pain. Good thing about this prison prayer group, we couldn't play those let's pretend it's not happening games. For one pretty obvious reason. For all the bad things we've done, there's nothing much more obviously in pain in a group of men all dressed up in a prison uniform, all full of regrets, worrying about our families, whatever it may be. And so we knew we were in pain, so we simply couldn't pretend it wasn't happening. And um, one shouldn't be afraid of pain as a launching pad for a spiritual journey. Um, I think it was Martin Luther who said, it is in our pain and in our brokenness that we come closest to Christ. And there may be people here today who will agree with me that that is profoundly true. It is often pain is the gateway to a deeper exploration of faith. So that was one thing that happened. We, because of our shared pain, we did open up to one another and eventually to God in prayer. The next P word. What is prayer? Um, I used to think um, that it was reading sonorous phrases out of Cranmer's 1662 prayer book, Light in Our Darkness, whatever it may be, and they are very beautiful prayers. But suddenly I was transformed into a world where people knew none of those things. And yet they were opening up to God and communicating with God, often in the most improbable language, not always polite language, imaginable. But you certainly got the sense that um, they were communicating uh, with God. And they were. 
No question of that. And really, what is perhaps daring to make the inner journey of starting to listen, starting to communicate with God, and to see then what happens? A lot of people don't dare to start the journey. But those who do, and this prayer group did, uh, do find uh, certain rewards, certain unexpected happenings. One of the most unexpected happenings, which especially with prisoners, um, not being knowingly easy about pleading guilty, um, is that um, prayer quite quickly leads you to another P word called penitence, or to give it its more familiar synonym, repentance. And because once you start to pray, you start to realize, gosh, there's a lot of bad junk around me or in me, and I really should perhaps open up about it and start to say sorry to God for it. The English word repentance, I think, is a very unattractive an ill-translated word. I don't know what you think of when you think of repentance, but I think of all kinds of rather negative experiences like uh, writing out a hundred lines, saying sorry over and over again repetitively, or standing in the corner, or in old days wearing sackcloth and ashes. These are the sort of familiar images of repentance. But that's at best only about a quarter of the ingredient. And you only realize this when you look at the language in which the original Gospels were written, where it was in the New Testament Greek, and the word repentance there is metanoia. And that translates literally as meta, a change, noia, a mind. Sometimes more richly translated over a change of heart and mind, in the image of a boat turning. And that, of course, is a much richer meaning than the idea that we are changing course, we are changing. And uh, so that's just always to me the real impact of repentance. It's a change of heart and mind. Repentance has certain drawbacks, uh, not to you, but to other people. Um, it, it, first of all, if you ever say to anybody, or it gets suggested, you might, somebody might be repenting. Uh, in prison, there was a lot of teasing. They go to the Jesus Reeks, they're repenting. You know, very convenient as the Corel reports, reports are being written next Tuesday. You know, so, uh, and I, both in prison and out of prison, have had buckets full of cynicism uh, put over the head that people just sort of like to believe and they tease you a bit. Um, and some people don't like that. Um, but uh, there is a good biblical test of whether anybody's repentance is genuine. It appears in the Synoptic Gospels very early on, John the Baptist is out there in the wilderness preaching, and he says, repent, so the good of And then he says, and those who repent will show the fruits of their repentance. Now, I was amazed over me a little faith, how in this prayer group, various guys started to show the fruits of the repentance. Uh, it may not sound uh, tremendously impressive, in a country village like this, but I assure you it was impressive in Belmarsh people when young men started to say, no, I'm not going to read porn magazines anymore, or I'm going to stop swearing, or I'm going to be polite to the prison officers, I'm going to try and be more friendly to the pariah prisoners on the wing, like the sex offenders. And these are big changes of individuals to see happening, and I can hardly believe it. Uh, well, we used to talk about these things every night as we came back to the program, and it was pretty amazing. The people who had the most amazing <laughs> problems with uh, repentance were those who were on drugs. Uh, because drugs flow through prisons like a river, they're very cheap, quite deliberately, the pushes lower the prices. So if you want drugs, you can have them. And if you are on drugs, it is very difficult to come off them and stay clean. So if you're trying to repent, as I repent of my drug taking, how do you um, get off it after you showing your penitence, willing to repent? It was a huge practical difficulty. Um, there is an interesting connection between the secular world and the spiritual world on particularly drug taking and 
um, trying to change the heart and mind, change the pattern of behavior. Many of you will know something about the Alcoholics Anonymous course. It's a secular course these days. It consists of about 12 steps, if I remember rightly. And somewhere along the line, about step number 10, which has been possible to get to, the secular course says, you may not be able to get beyond step number 10 um, by your own willpower. You may need the help of a higher power. And the secular course leaves that dangling. Um, but in a um, prison prayer group, which was all about Jesus and so on, we used to perhaps know who that higher power was. We thought this was God. Um, we thought that was the person who might give us the power. And um, so who were we praying to? Who was this higher power? I'll divert for a moment here. Fast forward. When I came out of prison, I had another unusual career change. I went, as my next institution, um, to a place where <coughs> there was worse food, more uncomfortable beds, and worse planning than a prison. This was an Anglican Theological College, called <laughs> <laughs> Wycliffe Hall, Oxford, where your vicar James and I are both alumni of, and I actually had uh, two of the most wonderful years of my life at Wycliffe, studying theology, which I was by this time getting really interested in. And when we arrived there, um, I realized that even though I was 55 years old, I still had to write a weekly essay, and about a stretch. And one of the more challenging topics very early on was writing an essay about the doctrine of the Trinity, what is meant by this three-person God, the Trinity. You'll be very relieved that I had no intention of trying to explain it to you now. I never quite, never quite understood it myself, academically, but I really understood it well in that prison prayer group, and I'll tell you why. I used to listen to the prayers of my fellow prisoners, and of course, say them myself. And many of them opened up, began their prayer, prayers very traditionally, Our Father, or O oh Father God. Those words had a particular resonance in the prison. Why? Because so many of the guys had no idea who their father was. They'd either never even known it. They had or they have been a complete absentee from their lives. So when you start to pray to our Father, it has a deep resonance, because a lot of these people have longed for a lot of paternal trust. One part of the Trinity. Others used to pray, O oh Lord Jesus, O oh Jesus Christ. And they, why did they do that? Well, we all came around the discussion, they longed for the things that Jesus stands for. Love, mercy, healing, forgiveness of sinners. They wanted that, so they prayed um, uh, over Lord Jesus. And the third group of people, um, and this included me, were most attracted to the mysterious third person of God, the Holy Spirit, who Jesus left behind at the time when he sent him, saying, I'm going to leave behind I, as a guide, as an advocate, as a comforter, uh, someone who will empower you. Do all kinds of things very often which are weak wills. We don't find it easy to do ourselves. So when you talk, when you weave these things together in a concentrated program, you begin to get a much better feeling of what the Trinity is all about than you do from any number of academic and theological sermons. Anyway, we were getting somewhere in this program. We were understanding gradually um, all kinds of things. And um, there were changes in the people, including me. Um, we, I think, one way of measuring why people were changing is to do the final word in my peace sequence, peace. On the whole, prison is the most uh, unpeaceful environment you can think of. And I now work in prison every day as a chaplain, so I really am. The fantastic noise, banging of doors, screaming, yelling, fights, shouting. It's a rough world out there in the prison. And nobody seems to be peaceful. And yet, of course, as you all know, even in the midst of turmoil and noise, it is possible to find inner peace. And uh, our own prayer book talks about that peace which the world cannot give. Quakers talk about peace in the center. It is very much a uh, spiritual virtue peace. And 
I kept on noticing, and um, lots more, but why is the officers starting to notice that some of these guys who have been pretty restless troublemakers in this group started to settle down and be more peaceful? I became more peaceful myself. And so that was all part of the trajectory going through these various stages from pain, penitence, prayer, uh, understanding about the power of the Holy Spirit and peace. I wish I could convey to you what an extraordinary experience this was to be part of this program and to start with the feel of changing myself and see other people change. I'll tell you one story that illustrates it all rather well. It's quite a music story that has some depth to it. One of the people who was a, became the most avid member of the Fair Program, who was really his founder, was my Irish burglar friend, Paddy. He went absolutely OTT uh, for the things he was hearing in the program, and he was a lapsed Catholic, but boy did he come back strong in his faith. And suddenly he popped into the program one afternoon and said, Oh, I've been thinking, uh, one of the things I many really regret that I've had six children and not one single one of them I brought up as a Christian. But now I'm a Christian myself, I've given my life to Christ. I'm going to have a newborn baby born since I've been here in prison. I've been touched my life. And we're going to have a christening here in the prison chapel. And I've been to see the chaplain and he's willing to do it. Would you all please come? It's, uh, we go up the next the prison chapel. So he needed to say, had his new best friends, the prayer group members, showed up, including me, in the prison chapel. It was a baptism service, I remember, as long as I lived. There were some distinctly odd features to it. Uh, the first was that the mother, Paddy's wife, brought in the baby, and she was clad in the most magnificent Christian dress you can begin to imagine. Yards and yards of expensive flowing white silk, uh, and this was the baby's christening dress. If you actually narrowed your eyes and looked a little bit closer, became very apparent that it was not a christening dress. It was an adult lady's bridal gown. And if I tried to guess which particular lorry this bridal gown might have fallen off the back of conveniently in order to get through Belmont Prison, I think I might have guessed it would have been a lorry on the way to the outside woman's shop because it was a ginormous dangerous, a very large lady that would have been quite nice indeed. Big enough probably for a couple of Wagnerian sopranos that were so uh, huge. Anyway, impressed all this. And then there came a moment when the baby was low into the threshold of this ginormous bridal gown. And when she entered this, she looked like a very small, fragile boat entering huge, billowing white waves. And the combination was inevitable. The boat was capsized. Not once, but several times. The good Roman Catholic Padre had got through a couple of prayers before the baby started in the centre. Whoops, she vanished into the puppy <laughs> boat and she moved on. And the crowd of members who were on the other congregation rushed round in the most very charming, almost angelic manner, died to the bone, just pulled her up, said little prayers, mocked the baby's brow, calmed her down. Um, just talking a bit and love you, my darling, God bless you. And then another sort of 40 seconds, whoops, she shot off into the ceiling dress and back. Again. So the movie we got very well, we had a huge audience participation service. <laughs> and as I saw the scene unfold, like some of you were at first rather amused. And then I saw her other feelings. I began feeling very protective of Mrs. Lady. I was having a rough time if I can go invisibly again. And I was feeling particularly protective because Paddy had done me the great honour of inviting me to be a godfather of the Christian variety uh, to this uh, small baby. And uh, so I just felt protective towards my uh, new goddaughter. And then a little bit, a moment or two later, a deeper thought occurred to me. I said, what is happening here? By chance, we were just a few days before Christmas. It was like December the 20th. And um, said, what's going on here? Um, here are a group of people who I got to know quite well and been praying with, who used to be some of the most disagreeable characters you can imagine. And they are behaving beautifully. 
that prayer of this child, knocking the child's brow. And yet, you know, just a few months ago, a few years ago, these were hands who had fingers on triggers. These were hands which had uh, round knives, type of. These were hands which had palms outstretched for the proceeds of drug deals. And yet here they are behaving completely differently, really beautifully, sweetly. Why? Because they've changed. Because they have experienced metanoia. Because perhaps they have met the hero of this story. And there's nothing very new about that. If you look at the Gospels carefully, you find time and time again that all kinds of bad people were changed by meeting Jesus, the hero of the story. Think of Zacchaeus, the corrupt businessman. Think of Mary Magdalene, the alleged prostitute. Think of Saul of Tarsus, stoning Christians one moment, becoming Paul the Great Apostle the next. They all changed. And I could see in this prison program, people had changed. I actually keep in touch with the prison program, um, or some of them at least. Um, when I was there, they used to say to me, oh, John, when you're out here, uh, you know, you go back to being a big cheese, you'll be uh, in the cabinet again. Thank goodness I wasn't. <laughs> Rather be in the Bishop Belmarsh prison. <laughs> but anyway, but that's what they used to say, that's a bit ridiculous. Um, but, um, and they say you'll never keep in touch. But actually, we have kept in touch with us. And, um, uh, I was ordained uh, some 14 months ago at St. Paul's Cathedral as a new uh, minister and deacon. And six of my old Belmarsh friends came. Amazing. So we haven't, and of course Paddy I keep in touch with, and his daughter, my goddaughter I see, she's now 20 years old, um, and a pretty attractive young woman. And so the links have sort of kept going. And um, somehow there's a journey here, there's a story here, and I sometimes don't quite know myself what it means, and I'm very willing, for a second or two, to open up for questions with you. But I, I will end on this note. I think what I'm telling you is a sort of 21st century repeat of some things that went on in the first century. People start to pray, start to reach out to Jesus, and life has changed. And those are changes which um, we are often very reluctant to attempt. I'll bet the convicts that are incredibly conservative in their ways, slow to change, I'll bet many people in a sort of English small town or village like this one are reluctant to do these slightly uncomfortable things that we're talking about. You don't have to go to prison to do it, just to sort of start thinking, start praying, start the journey. That an oil chain. So it's open to you just as it was open to me, it was open to my fellow prisoners. And as I close, I look out across a big audience like this, and I say to myself quietly, I hope there's not one person here tonight who hears this story and will say to themselves pretty well the same words as Paddy said to himself when we were having coffee on that first day. You know, I'd really like to try that path yourself. If any of you would talk to your vicar James or to anyone else who you think might be able to help you, and you will find that that path is the most rewarding and wonderful journey in the world. Thank you for listening. Thank you. So now's an opportunity to perhaps just to come back on anything that um, you felt really interesting that Jonathan touched on, or perhaps another question of some kind. Uh, there's all sorts of things you could ask. So we've got about 30 minutes perhaps to ask those questions you'd like to. And I can see hands going up straight away. So, so. I don't need that. Okay. Uh, mine isn't so much a question as a contribution. I was at the office of Inside Time this afternoon, which you'll be familiar yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. 
and uh, I was speaking to one of the gentlemen working there, and I said I was coming to your talk this evening. Can everyone hear? Yeah. No, sorry. I'm take so the, sorry. Take the microphone. All right, I will take the microphone. Yes, anyway, I was at the office of Inside Time, which is a magazine which is distributed in prisons to, to help the inmates pass their time, shall we say. And uh, I was chatting to an elderly gentleman in the corner, told him I was coming here this evening. And he said, oh, he said, oh, I was in Belmarsh with him. I said, oh, really, what's he like? He said, a very, very nice chap. <laughs> <laughs> Nice chap um, was uh, the big face on my wing, the head honcho, yeah. and his name is Razor Smith. Oh, really? And um, Razor, uh, talk to me like that. yeah, she does. Yeah. <laughs> um, and anyway, Razor um, was four doors along from me, and I was told, so you know, anything you want here, you can <laughs> get it or anything like the stop by Razor, you know. Anyway, about three days later, Razor, who's a big man, he's taller than me, he's much taller than me, terrible history. Um, and he said to me, um, uh, are you by any chance any friend of Mickey Howard, effing Mickey Howard? It's because of him, he was referring to Michael Howard, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> And his three strikes are right. I'm now, in, now doing a life sentence. And I, he said this was great menace. And I had about 10 seconds to decide. Uh, well, it's so hard, I can stand like a I hardly knew him. But actually, he was one of my good friends at the end of the next sort of decision. So I thought, I'd better, I was sure I was in, in prison to perjure, but I tried to start changing. So I said, um, Actually, Michael Howard, I'm very sorry that this change in the rules made your sentence longer. He's a very decent guy, he's a good friend of me, uh, and he's got very good qualities. And Razor said, I don't know what was going to happen. This moment, he's unbloomed. But, and then he said, oh, well, well, at least you're effing loyal. <laughs> that would be some good in here. Anyway, an extraordinary way Razor and I established relationship. He's actually a very talented man. He's written two books. One sold over 60,000 copies in hardback, has the rather exotic title, A Few Kind Words and the, Lay and the Loaded Gun by <laughs> Razor Smith. But he has actually changed and prison service actually sorted him out because they went off to Grendon Underwood, which is yeah. the psychiatric prison. It, I hesitate to say help, but it changed his journey that is much loved eldest son was killed in most of the in age 18. And he's now got a very good job on uh, Inside Time. He is the, effectively the deputy editor. And he's a good job. He was one of the guys, he's one of the guys who came to um, my ordination. He wrote a very amusing article in Inside Time because I have a party after the ordination at the nearest big room which we could hire which is the top floor of the old baby. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rather than a joke, I thought. Raise his hand up and he said, you know, I've been to the old baby many times, but I've always been in the cell. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he is a character. Mm. And uh, uh, I'm very pleased to see him again. Give him my warm regards. Another question here. Yes, thank you very, very much. This is on, yes. Very good to hear you to see. I'm just wondering if John Aiken and the chaplain Prison chaplain has yet come across Jonathan Aiken as a prison cell prayer room. And if so, uh, the interface between the chaplaincy and your prayer room, did it, was the one? Um, and if not, and if it is a rare event, do you reflect on life to think perhaps this is a special gift of God mm. to send you the way you have? Well, let me take those questions more as a reverse. Um, first of all, um, Jonathan Aiken, the prison chaplain, has a lot of time to think about life as a prisoner, and is a great advantage. Uh, my first day on duty in Pentonville, I went down to the 
safety unit, sort of bad boys. And, and the guy started shouting at me, Ethel Pi. I wonder what that is saying, but in prison slang, I'm not getting quite good at Pi and liquor equals liquor. So he was saying, yeah. get lost, liquor. Yeah. I don't want to speak to you, I don't want to talk. And I said, well, oh, hang on. I used to be in prison. Dad will leave me, he said. And I said, yes, where were you? I said, Belmarsh, Elmley, Stanford Hill. Well, and then we started a conversation. And then after about five minutes of conversation, I said, well, you, okay, you know, I knew a little bit about it about the sun. Would you like to pray? And we did. And so one of the things that I know about from my prison experience is actually if you say, as I do, quite so unaggressive about it, I'm in the praying business. Would you like to pray? Would you like to pray? Surprisingly, how high the percentage, including Muslims, say, yeah, okay, I don't mind. I don't mind if I lose, I'm a sale. Um, but they, they say, and so I have learned things from the prison program, which are highly relevant to my job as chaplain today. I think you asked about the um, chaplaincy and the program. Um, this got started by Paddy without any reference to chaplaincy. But the chaplain heard about it and was amazed and said, do you think I can come one evening? Uh, and um, so he did. And he did something rather wonderful. He sat down and I said, would you like to show me on this? And then he peeled off his dog collar and said, I just, please don't think me of the chaplain tonight. Um, I'm a sinner too. Mm -hmm. So like that. Um, the final question I think you asked, if I got it right, is did I think it would be a gift of God to be sent to prison? Well, in a way. In a way. <laughs> well, of course, God hates sin, so um, he doesn't like people who commit perjury or any other kind of crime. But insofar as we go to divine this for serious purposes, I think I would say, with a very grateful heart, actually, despite the agony of all, actually, or the catastrophe, I am very grateful to God for having been sent to prison. Who else gets a new job at 75? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, if the evidence hadn't been produced and you had won your final action against the government of the BBC, do you think you would arrive at where you are today? Well, I certainly wouldn't have um, uh, arrived being a prison chaplain. <laughs> Uh, no, I think um, I, had, I had learned a few things. Uh, but probably people haven't clue what I was talking about. So perhaps I should just learn. I had this libel case against the guy who started in one place and ended up in another. But the place it ended up in <coughs> was had I told a lie about paying my wife paying the Ritz bill, and this was unprovable either way. Until suddenly, at the last minute, I think this is what you're referring to, um, some sleuth produced air tickets to prove my wife could not have been in a place paying the the Ritz, and that was conclusive evidence, so the case then collapsed and my life was exploded into ruins. Um, but if that evidence hadn't been found, um, actually, I think it's common ground between the Guardian and myself that they were losing the case. And I was winning. So what would have happened if the um, case had ended with uh, damages being awarded, 18 as one, guarded defeated? I think I would have been more, much too cautious to be triumphalist. I was not going to pursue the guardian for damages that was in my mind. I was going to say, uh, in victory, magnanimity, let's go on. But of course I would have hoped to resume my political career. I'm not sure that would be a very happy thing, but I, I certainly not have ended up in Brexit. But nevertheless, I think yeah, I would have you know, pretended everything was all right and gone on. But when you get to those things that I was talking about earlier, uh, true penitence, of course, can only start when you have actually confessed everything. And um, so I, I would obviously wouldn't have done that, I think, if I had ended victorious instead of ruined from the case. So, truthfully, I think I'd have pretended that everything was all right. But um, in reality, I'm very glad it went the other way.
you engage with uh, prisoners as well in your position as prison chaplain as you could when you were one of them? I think almost better. First of all, they now know that Pentaville knows that an ex-con, and that's the strength. Uh, secondly, I'm older, and rather curiously, um, prisoners, particularly young prisoners, um, don't mind the uh, sort of grey or white hairs, and they will listen more carefully. Um, and I think huge numbers of these young men are really longing for a bit of mentorship, um, a bit of help, and I think it's a lot easier to give that as a prison chaplain uh, than it is as a fellow prisoner, even though you can do some good work as a fellow prisoner. Who knows when you're trying to communicate with sort of deep matters of the heart, but I'm pretty happy with being a prison chaplain who's been an ex-prisoner. So I didn't quite hear the good mention. Paddy. Oh, Paddy, Paddy. Yes, absolutely. Paddy has learned to write very well. Um, and um, he actually engaged while in the prison. There are literacy courses, and he uh, got there. Most people who can't read or write in prison spend a huge amount of energy in pretending it's not mm -hmm. happening. And uh, they sort of say, oh, what's your glasses? Could you just read that? Notice, or um, sorry, I got a speck in my eye. Uh, could you read? So they can see it. But I think the program really persuaded Pat is it was worth going to the very limited uh, basic literacy skills classes. And they are wonderful, rewarding. I have a memory of being in the prison chapel right at the end of my sentence. And there was a very tough cookie who was beside me in the chapel, and we were singing some hymn. And he started to cry. And I knew him. So when the hymn finished, I would go to give him a squeeze and said, oh, I'm so sorry, Fred. Uh, have you had a knockback? Prison slang for bad news. I said, no, no, I was weeping tears of joy I was. First time in my life I can read the bleeding words. <laughs> <laughs> and it is life transforming. And if I was uh, ever politician in charge of prison ministry and the secular setting, I think I would say, let's make reading and writing courses compulsory. Mm -hmm. um, the good and old one said, um, when you run to see that that just sees it, and I think all that is not. You told us a very powerful story of how you have brought faith and, uh, and, and, and your spiritualism into the, into the prison. As a former politician, what um, words of reflection or wisdom can you uh, give us about how we can improve and develop the, the way the prison system runs in this country today? Well, the prison system is a lot more decent than it is in other countries. Uh, on the whole, the prison officers are quite a good lot, um, fairly well disciplined, and. Um, the um, uh, British prisons are not inhumane, they are often very unsatisfactory. Pentonville, if I was to take any around it, you'd feel, and I'd feel quite ashamed just by the crumbling infrastructure, the conservatives, the overcrowding, not surprising um, that uh, you know, there's an awful lot of violence. We had two suicides in Pentonville last month, we have a fight a day at least, um, uh, and it's quite rough. Um, but the staff are quite good, the spirit, even in an overcrowded prison like that, isn't that bad. So we shouldn't be sort of too ashamed of our prison system. It doesn't work very well. The worst thing I know about the prison system is that roughly seven out of every ten people who are released are back behind bars within two years. That's a huge change. Now we've been here all night, I was to say, all the suggestions I would love to make. But perhaps um, I would uh, single out too. First of all, of course, the um, uh, resources devoted to the prison service 
uh, need to be enlarged. And this is not a popular bit of government spending. I used to be Chief Secretary of the Treasury, so I, I know how every sort of few million pounds is fought over by pounds. And of course, prisons have no votes. Uh, lobbies of prisons are very small, and yet fundamental decency that needs to be applied. It does require some new resources. I think what's for new resources? It needs people like you, and indeed me, but I'm there already, to get interested in prison. <coughs> and to start to say, well, why do seven out of ten people go back? If we were people in ordinary life went to the dentist for wisdom too, seven out of ten of them went back to the dentist for the same wisdom too, there's something wrong with the dentistry right here. Mm. And there's something really quite fundamentally wrong. And if I say the biggest thing is wrong, is that I mean, what is the purpose of prison? I mean, it's really one keeping public safe and very dangerous people, and I've met enough of these dangerous people, including Razor Smith, that you know that there are, uh, that's a good purpose of prison. Secondly, I'm old fashioned enough to believe that punishment for crime is right and needs to be uh, enforced sometimes by imprisonment. But the third purpose of prison, which our Victorian ancestors are very good at, and we have failed. <coughs> is the rehabilitation of offenders. Um, and the probation service is not a rehabilitation service anymore, so it, it does its best as supervision. Only people, government has failed miserably. Uh, and, and of all for the colours, the last one effort which was called transforming, re 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 transforming Rehabilitation. A bold and brave initiative was everything at the time, but Chris Grayling Somehow got it wrong and it collapsed. Um, <coughs> so, uh, only people who can do it are charities. Some do it very well. And the uh, last Justice Secretary I said, stop trying to spend government money directly on rehabilitation. Be like the Department of um, Overseas Aid, if it was a fine, you know, just aid, spending its time to projects or agencies, giving them money to get on with. You should give some of the money for rehabilitation to the best charities, and you do much, much better. So rehabilitation is a big failure, and that's the big one I would concentrate on. It could be pulled around much, much better, and I know one or two charities which do it very well. So there is hope there we're not doing it well at the moment. If prisoners could vote, would that make a very big change because politicians would take more interest in them? Um, I'm sorry to say it's not a very wise suggestion. I tell you what, first of all, if you just go to prison and say, anything you'd like to change, any new rights you'd like to have, uh, uh, there are plenty of things like, like the right to use the telephone more often, right to use the internet, and that's such a good job. In the Olympic Games of prison requirements, the vote has the status of tiddlywinks. It's not. They don't want to, they're not interested. Um, most prisons are there almost too short a time to ever have a vote. Um, it's, I mean, I just don't feel very strongly about it. Yeah. Some countries give the vote, yeah. some don't. There doesn't make much difference either way. But the idea that this is a great cause, the last time I was on was voting on, an extraordinary, mainly because it came from the European Union, it wasn't very popular at the time. Something like 450 MPs voted against giving prisoners the vote, and something like 70 voted uh, for giving prisoners the vote. I'm an agnostic on the subject. <coughs> I think maybe when people are in the last year of the sentence, maybe you offer them the vote as an extra. But nobody really cares about it. Two more questions, one here. You talked about um, uh, the fact that you went to study theology. Was that because you sense to call it specifically to minister to the prison environment? Was that because you felt that sense of calling to ministry generally and then later on you ended up working that out in the back in prison context again? When I started to read theology, I didn't really know why I was there. In fact, I thought of leaving after the first week. Um, <clears throat> what I knew didn't uh, I say I knew, sort of seeing it through a glass darkly, but somehow I had 
spiritual hunger. I wanted to know more about this God who was becoming so important to me. I wanted to find out more. And so to study him in a theological college uh, seemed uh, a good idea. I didn't have the faintest idea or uh, ambition, that's the right word, or calling to become a vicar. In fact, I thought I was totally wrong for it. I didn't think the church would have me anyway. But, uh, so when I began, I was on a sort of voyage of inquiry, but, and the, the two years of Wicked uh, were wonderful in the sense that, in addition to learning all kinds of things from uh, the sort of academic side of it, I learned New Testament Greek, which I haven't done school, I had to learn some Hebrew to do the Psalms, I had to study, as James had done, all the scriptures, the gospel, and I really got into it. Um, but um, I, and I, well, I knew at the end of it, but I'd like to do something. Um, and I thought probably prison ministry was quite a good idea. And I had a great friend who was a famous American a prison minister leader called Chuck Colson, a thesel. His British prison wouldn't let me in for a bit. That's why I went to America and learned for a lot from him. And it was only about three years ago that I started to get this mysterious murmurings of, um, See, was it God saying in my brother, I want you to get ordained? And I have said, I don't want to like I'm saying now, please shut up, God, I'm too old, I'm not right for this, and leave me alone. And then the man started to say, actually, I meant I wanted you to be a prison chaplain. And then I said, well, perhaps I could be useful there, the very short prison chaplains, and that's how I got away. But when I went off to read theology, I really didn't know what I was doing except to say that I was searching, both spiritually, academically, every way. And I didn't get ordained for another 19, 18 years, so it took some time. The hand of heaven got me in the end. Yes? Um, I've just listened to you this evening, and I've been thinking about the
as my own research, and as a kind of judge, but I'm doing my daughter gave this a, a, a frightening piece of her mind. I heard all kinds of things I thought here as a father about how she would be scared, set her no rather to serve her partner, and how she'd really been terrified of her sister even though she'd run after her. And the young guy doesn't even have any idea that he might have sort of damaged her contemporary feelings and emotions and life. And he started to really crumble and cry. And it's the first time, uh, very often in restorative justice cases, that an offender realizes some of the things that they have done and their impact. And it's quite good, it's really cutting some cameras. So it's a small area, but some police forces are doing very well, and it's just a bit different. Well, I think we ought to draw the evening to a close, and we both want to work really hard to see this has been for a while. I was quite encouraged on the way down, he told me that um, as well as his prison work, he's currently doing his curacy, um, which of course means that when his vicar's aware of all this, he's going to work very hard. So we've been an awful lot of talking in the last month or two, um, we made you talk a lot this evening, but we're very grateful because you shared a lot about uh, all that's happened in your life. And I think a, a number of lessons of interest and moving things for us to hear. So we're very appreciative. I think we should put our hands together.